Definition of Anarchism for the Encyclopedia Britannica. Kropotkin. Anarchism, a definition anarchism, from the Greek in, and ark, contrary to authority, is the name given to a principle or theory of life and conduct conceived by a society without government, in which harmony is obtained, not by submission to law, nor obedience to authority, but by free agreements established between the various groups, territorial and professional, freely constituted for production and consumption, and for the satisfaction of the infinite variety of needs and aspirations of a civilized being. In a society developed on these guidelines, voluntary associations that have already begun to cover all fields of human activity would acquire an even greater extension to the point of replacing the state in all its functions. They would represent an interwoven network, composed of an infinite variety of groups and federations of all sizes and degrees, local, regional, national and international, temporary or more or less permanent, for all possible purposes, production, consumption and exchange, communications, health services, education, mutual protection, defense of the territory, etc., and, on the other hand, for the satisfaction of a growing number of scientific, artistic, literary and social relationship needs. Furthermore, such a society would not claim to be immutable. On the contrary, as in the whole of organic life, harmony would derive from a perpetual and variable adjustment and readjustment of the balance of the multitude of forces and influences, and this adjustment would be obtained. In short, if no force enjoys the special protection of the state, if society, according to this, were organized according to these principles, man would not be limited, in the free exercise of his capacity for productive work, by a capitalist monopoly supported by the state, nor in the exercise of his will out of fear of punishment, or out of obedience to metaphysical entities or to individuals who both lead to diminished initiative and intellectual civility. Man would be guided by his own reason which would necessarily bear the imprint of the free action and reaction of his own self and the ethical conceptions of the environment. Man could thus achieve the full development of all his powers, intellectual, artistic and moral, without being forced to work exhaustingly for the monopolists, or hampered by the civility and intellectual inertia of the great majority. He could thus achieve the full individualization that is not possible under the current system of individualism, nor under any system of state socialism of the so-called Volkstadt, people's state. Anarchist authors also consider that his conception is not a utopia based on an a priori method, after having postulated a few wishes that are taken for real events. It is derived, they claim, from an analysis of trends that are already at work although state socialism may find temporary support among reformers. The progress of modern technique, which wonderfully simplifies the production of all the elements necessary for life, the growing spirit of independence and the rapid expansion of free initiative and free understanding in all branches of activity, including those previously considered the attribute of church and state, firmly reinforce the tendency of non-government. Regarding their economic conceptions, the anarchists, together with all the socialists, of which they are the left wing, maintain that the system of private property of the land that prevails today, our capitalist production as a function of profit, represents a monopoly that goes at the same time against the principles of justice and the imperatives of utility. It is the reason that the fruits of modern technique are not put at the service of all and produce general well-being. Anarchists consider the wage system and capitalist production an obstacle to progress. But they also point out that the state was, and continues to be, the main instrument for a few to monopolize the land, and for the capitalists to appropriate a totally disproportionate volume of the accumulated annual surplus of production. Consequently, while fighting the current land monopoly and capitalism, anarchists fight with equal energy the state as the mainstay of the system. Not this or that special form of state, but the state itself, be it a monarchy or even a republic governed by referendum. Having always been the organization of the state, both in ancient and modern history, Macedonian Empire, Roman Empire, modern European states built on the ruins of free cities.
the instrument for establishing monopolies of the dominant minorities, it cannot be used for the destruction of such monopolies. Anarchists therefore consider that to hand over to the state all the main sources of economic life, land, mines, railways, banking, insurance, etc., as well as control of all the main branches of industry, in addition to all the functions that it already accumulates in its hands, education, religion supported by the state, defense of the territory, etc., it would mean creating a new instrument of domination. State capitalism would only increase the powers of the bureaucracy and capitalism. The real progress is in decentralization, both territorial and functional, in the development of local spirit and personal initiative, and in the free federation from the simple to the complex, instead of the current hierarchy that goes from center to periphery. Anarchists, with most socialists, recognize that, like all natural evolution, the slow evolution of society is sometimes followed by periods of accelerated evolution which are called revolutions, and they believe that the era of revolutions is not yet over. Periods of rapid change will be followed by others of slow evolution, and these periods must be used, not to increase and broaden the powers of the state but to reduce them, forming organizations in every town or commune of local groups of producers and consumers as well as regional federations, and eventually international, of these groups. Anarchists refuse, by virtue of the principles set out, to participate in the current statist organization and to support it and infuse it with new blood. They do not intend to constitute, and they invite workers not to do so, political parties for parliaments. Therefore, since the International Association of Workers was created, 1864-66. They have tried to propagate their ideas directly in the workers' organizations, and induce them to a direct fight against capital, without placing any faith in parliamentary legislation. The historical development of anarchism the outline conception of society, and the trend of which it is a dynamic expression, have always existed in the human species, as opposed to the hierarchical conception and trend that prevail today alternating their predominance in different periods of history. To the first trend we owe the evolution, the work of the masses themselves, of those institutions, the clan, the Adian community, the guild, the medieval free city, by which the masses resisted the invasions of the conquerors and eager minorities. Of power. This same tendency manifested itself with great energy in the great religious movements of medieval times especially in the early Reformation and its precedents. At the same time it found clear expression in the works of some thinkers, from the time of Lao Tzu, although, due to its popular and non-scholastic origin, it had much less echo among scholars than the opposite trend. As noted by Professor Adler in his Gestschicht des Socialismus und Communismus. Aristippus, NC 430 BC, one of the founders of the Cyrenaic school, already taught that the sage should not cede his freedom to the state, and, in response to a question from Socrates, said that he did not wish to belong even to the ruling class or the ruled. But he dictated this attitude, apparently, a simple Epicurean view of village life. The best exponent of anarchist philosophy in ancient Greece was Zeno, 342-267 or 270 BC, a Cretan founder of the Stoic school, who opposed a clear conception of a free community without government to Plato's status utopia. He repudiated the omnipotence of the state, its interventionist and regulatory character, and proclaimed the sovereignty of the moral law of the individual, underlining since, although the necessary instinct of self-defense leads man to selfishness, nature has provided a corrective by giving man another instinct, the social. When men are reasonable enough to follow their natural instincts, they will unite across borders and constitute the cosmos. They will no longer need courts of law or police. They will not have temples or public cults. They will not use any currency. There will be free donations instead of exchanges. Unfortunately, the works of Zeno have not reached us and we only know fragmentary quotations. However, the fact that his very formulation is similar to the formulation used today shows how profound is the tendency of human nature for which he was the spokesperson.
In medieval times, we find the same views on the state in the illustrious Bishop of Alba, Marco Girolamo Vida, in his first dialogue de dignitate publici, Ferdinando Cavalli, in Men. Del Stituto Vento, 13. Doctor E. Nis, Researches in the History of Economics. But it is mostly in various early Christian movements, beginning in the 9th century in Armenia, and in the preaching of the early Hussites, especially Chojeki, and the early Anabaptists, especially Hans Denk, Keller, Ein Apostel der Wieder Torfer, where we find the same ideas vigorously expressed, emphasizing, of course, above all, their moral aspects. Rabelais and Finalin, in their utopias, also expressed similar ideas, frequent also in the 18th century among French encyclopedists, as can be deduced from isolated expressions that are found sporadically in the works of Rousseau, in Diderot's preface to the voyage of Bougainville, etc. However, such ideas could not develop then probably because of the strict censorship of the Roman Catholic Church. These ideas found expression later during the Great French Revolution. While the Jacobins were doing their best to centralize everything in the hands of the government, it has now been discovered, by recently published documents, that the popular masses, in their municipalities and sections, managed to carry out considerable constructive work. They were awarded the choice of judges, the organization of supplies and equipment for the army and the big cities, they provided jobs for the unemployed, they directed charitable works, and so on. They even tried to establish a direct correspondence between the 36,000 communes of France through a special council, outside the National Assembly, Sigismund Lacroix, Actes de la Commune de Paris. It was Godwin, in his inquiry concerning political justice, 2 vols, 1793 who first formulated the political and economic conceptions of anarchism, although he did not give such a name to the ideas expounded in his remarkable work. Laws, he wrote, are not the product of the wisdom of our ancestors, they are the product of their passions, their shyness, their envy, and their ambition. The remedy they offer is worse than the ills they claim to cure. If all laws and courts were abolished, and only in that case, and if lawsuits arising from reasonable men chosen for this purpose were left to decide, then genuine justice would gradually be created. As for the state, Godwin openly called for its abolition. A society, he wrote, can exist perfectly without government, if the communities are small and absolutely autonomous. Regarding property, he affirmed that only justice should regulate the rights of everyone to every object capable of contributing to the benefit of a human being. The object should go to those who need it most. His conclusion was communism. But Godwin did not have the courage to hold his views. He later fully reworked his chapter on property and mitigated his communist views in the second edition of Political Justice, 8 vols, 1796. Proudhon was the first to use in 1840, what is property? The name of anarchy, applying it to the social state of no government. The name of anarchists, had been applied abundantly by Girondists during the French Revolution to revolutionaries who did not consider that the task of the revolution should be limited to overthrowing Louis XVI, and insisted that a series of economic measures be taken, abolition of rights feudal lands without compensation return to village communities of communal lands fenced in since 1669, limitation of land ownership to 120 acres, progressive income tax, national organization of exchanges on a fair value basis, which it was already beginning to be put into practice, and so on. Proudhon therefore advocated a society without government and used the term anarchy to designate it. Proudhon rejected, as is known any scheme of communism that could lead the human species to end up in communist monasteries or barracks, or also all the plans of state socialism, or protected by the state, proposed by Louis Blanc and the collectivists. When he proclaimed in his first memoir about property, property is theft, he only alluded to property in its present sense, according to Roman law, of right of use and abuse. He understood, on the other hand, property rights in the limited sense of possession, considering it the best protection against interference by the state. At the same time, 
he did not want to violently dispossess the owners of land, houses, houses, factories, and so on. He preferred to achieve the same end by establishing that capital could not produce interest, and it was proposed to achieve this with a national bank, based on the mutual trust of all those dedicated to production, who would agree to exchange their products according to the cost value, through work checks that represented the hours of work necessary to produce a certain item. Under this system, which Proudhon called mutualism, all exchanges of services would be strictly equivalent. Furthermore, such a bank could lend money without interest, demanding only about 1%, even less, to cover administration costs. With anyone being able to borrow the money necessary to buy a house, no one would want to pay rent a year to use it. Thus, without expropriation, a general social liquidation would be easily achieved. The same applied to mines, railways, factories, and so on. In such a society, the state would be useless. The main relationships between citizens would be based on free agreement and would be regulated by simple accounting. Disputes would be resolved by arbitration. The most outstanding characteristics of Proudhon's work were a deep critique of the state and all possible forms of government and a penetrating vision of all economic problems. We must add that French mutualism had its precursor in England in William Thompson, who began as a mutualist before becoming a communist, and in his followers John Gray, a lecture on human happiness. 1825, The Social System, 1831, and J. F. Braille, Labour's Wrongs and Labour's Remedy, 1839. It also had its precursor in America. Josiah Warren, born 1798, C.W. Bayliss, Josiah Warren, the first American anarchist, Boston. 1900, who belonged to Owen's New Harmony, and considered that the failure of this endeavor was due more than anything to the suppression of individuality and lack of initiative and responsibility. These defects, he taught, were inherent in any plan based on authority and community of goods. He advocated, therefore, for the complete freedom of the individual. In 1827 he opened a small rural warehouse in Cincinnati that was the first equity warehouse, and which people called Shendetai Impo, because it was based on hour-by-hour hour changed work of all kinds of products. The cost limit of the price, and consequently the abolition of interest, was the watchword of his warehouse, and later of his Pueblo Equidad, next to New York, which still existed in 1865. Mr. Keith's Equity House in Boston, created in 1855, is also worth mentioning. While Proudhon's economic ideas, and especially the Mutual Aid Bank, found support and even practical application in the United States, his anarchic political conception found little echo in France, where the Christian socialism of Le Menis and the Fourierists, and the state socialism of Louis Blanc and the followers of Saint Simon, dominated. These ideas, however, found some temporary support among the German Hegelians, Moses Hess in 1843 and Karl Grun in 1845, who advocated anarchism. Furthermore, as Wilhelm Weitling's authoritarian communism gave rise to opposition among the Swiss workers, Wilhelm Marr expressed it in the 1940s. On the other hand, individualist anarchism found, also in Germany, full expression in Max Stirner, Caspar Schmidt, whose notable works, Der Inzige und Sein Eigentum and his articles in Rich Zetung, remained completely unknown until John Henry Mackay came to attention. About them. Professor V. Barshk, in the excellent introduction to his interesting book, L'Individualism Anarchist, Max Stirner, 1904, has shown how the development of German philosophy from Kant to Hegel, and Schelling's absolute and Hegel's gist, inevitably provoked, at the beginning of the anti-Hegelian revolt, the preaching of the same absolute in the field of the rebels. This was done by Steimer, who advocated not only a total rebellion against the state and against the servitude that authoritarian communism would impose on men, but also the full liberation of the individual from all social and moral ties, the rehabilitation of the self the supremacy of the individual, complete amoralism, and the association of the selfish. 
Professor Bashk has already indicated the final meaning of this kind of individual anarchism, that the aim of every higher civilization is not to make all members of the community develop normally, but to allow certain better endowed individuals to develop fully, even at the cost of happiness and the very existence of the great majority of human beings. It is thus a return to the most vulgar individualism, defended by all the supposed superior minorities, to whom in reality man in his history owes, precisely, the state and everything else that these individualists fight. His individualism comes to a denial of his own starting point, not to mention the impossibility for the individual to achieve real full development in the conditions of oppression of the masses by the beautiful aristocrats his development would be one-sided. For this reason, such an ideological direction, despite its undoubted success in advocating the full development of each individuality, only finds an echo in limited artistic and literary circles. The anarchism of the International Association of Workers after the defeat of the Parisian workers insurrection in June 1848 and the fall of the Republic, there was a general decline in propaganda in all currents of socialism. The entire socialist press was practically paralyzed during a period of reaction that lasted 20 years. However, even anarchist thought made progress, mainly in the works of Belgarique, Codroy, and especially Joseph de Jacques, Les Lazarines, La Humanisme, an anarcho communist utopia, recently discovered and republished. The socialist movement only revived after 1864, when some French workers, all mutualists, met in London during the World's Fair with English followers of Robert Owen and founded the International Workers' Association. This association developed very quickly and adopted a policy of direct economic struggle against capitalism, without intervening in parliamentary political life, and continued this policy until 1871. After the Franco-Prussian War, when the International Association of Workers in France was banned after the insurrection of the Commune. The German workers, who had been given the right to vote in the elections to the newly constituted Imperial Parliament, insisted on modifying the tactics of the International and began to form a Social Democratic political party. This soon led to a division in the International, whose Latin federations, the Spanish, the Italian, the Belgian and the Eurasic, France could not be represented formed among themselves a federal union that totally broke with the general Marxist council of the organization. Within these federations, what can be called modern anarchism developed. The federates, together with the names of federalists and anti-authoritarians, had for a time used that of anarchists, which their adversaries insisted on applying to them, and which prevailed and was ultimately vindicated. Bakunin quickly became the guiding spirit of these Latin federations in the development of the principles of anarchism, which he did in numerous writings, pamphlets, and letters. He called for the total abolition of the state, according to him the product of religion, corresponding to a more backward stage of civilization, and which represented the denial of freedom and corrupted even what it intended to do for the common welfare. The state was a historically necessary evil but it would be equally necessary, sooner or later, its total extinction. Repudiating all legislation, until the birth of universal suffrage, Bakunin asked for full autonomy for each nation, region and commune, as long as they did not constitute a threat to their neighbors, and full independence for the individual, adding that one is only truly free when others are free, and in proportion to that freedom of all the free federations of the communes would form free nations. As for his economic ideas, Bakunin said, in common with his federalist comrades of the international, a collectivist anarchist, not as Vidal and Bakur in the 1940s, or their modern social democratic followers, but as a defense of a state of affairs in which all the means of production were the common property of the free labor groups and communes, and in which the system of remuneration for work communist or otherwise, should be established by each group. The social revolution, whose proximity all socialists then predicted, would be the means of giving life to the new conditions. The Jurassic, Spanish, and Italian federations and sectors of the International Workers Association, as well as the French, German, and American anarchist groups, 
were during the following years the main centers of anarchist thought and propaganda. They refrained from participating in parliamentary politics and always maintained close contact with the workers' organizations. But in the second half of the 80s and early 90s, when the influence of the anarchists began to be perceived in the strikes, in the May Day demonstrations, in which they defended the idea of a general strike for the day of eight hours, and in the anti-militarist propaganda in the army, a violent repression began against them, especially in Latin countries, including physical torture in the Montjuic Castle in Barcelona, and in the United States, execution of five anarchists from Chicago in 1887. Against these persecutions the anarchists replied with acts of violence that were in turn followed by more executions from above and new acts of revenge from below. This created in the general public the impression that the basic essence of anarchism was violence, a point of view rejected by its supporters, who maintain that in reality all parties resort to violence when they are prevented from direct action by repression, and extraordinary laws declare them outlaws. Anarchism continued to develop, partly in the Proudhonian, mutualist, direction, but mostly as anarcho-communism, to which was added a third direction, Leon Tolstoy's anarcho-Christian, and a fourth that could be called literary anarchism, and started by some prominent writers modern. Proudhon's ideas, especially regarding mutual banking, correspond to those of Josiah Warren, and found considerable echo in the United States giving rise to a different school, whose names can be found in the bibliography of the Anarchy of the United States. Dr. Netlow. He has held a prominent position among the individualist anarchists of America, Benjamin R. Tucker, whose Liberty newspaper was founded in 1881, and whose ideas are a combination of those of Proudhon and Herbert Spencer. Starting from the principle that anarchists are selfish, strictly speaking, and that each group of individuals, be it the Secret League of a Few or the Congress of the United States, has the right to oppress all the rest of the human species, always that he has the necessary power, that equal freedom for all and absolute equality must be law, and that taking care of each one of his own affairs is the only moral rule of anarchism. Tucker goes on to show that a comprehensive and general application of such principles would be beneficial and not dangerous because the powers of each individual would be limited by the exercise of the equal rights of all others. He then indicated, following H. Spencer, the difference that exists between the usurpation of someone's rights and the resistance to that usurpation, between domination and defense, the former being equally reprehensible, either the usurpation carried out on an individual by a criminal, or that of one over all others, or that of all the others over one while resistance to use a patient is defensible and necessary. In their own defense, both the citizen and the group have the right to any violence, including capital punishment. Violence is also justified to make respect for an agreement mandatory. Tucker thus follows Spencer, and, like him, opens, in the opinion of the writer, the path of reconstitution, under the guise of defense, of all the functions of the state. His criticism of the present state is very penetrating, and his defense of the rights of the individual is very vigorous. As for his economic ideas, he follows B. R. Tucker to Proudhon. The individualist anarchism of the North American Proudhonists, however, finds little echo in the working masses. Those who profess it, mainly intellectuals, soon understand that the individualization they so extol is not attainable by individual efforts. Either they abandon the anarchist ranks and indulge in the liberal individualism of the classical economists, or else they take refuge in a kind of Epicurean amoralism, or Superman theory, similar to those of Stirner and Nietzsche. Most anarchist workers prefer anarcho-communist ideas that have gradually evolved from the anarchist collectivism of the International Workers Association. To this direction belong, and I name only the best-known exponents of anarchism. Elisio Reckless, Jean Grave, Sebastian Fourier and Emilio Portugate in France, Enrico Malatas to and Govli in Italy, R. Mella, A. Lorenzo and the authors, most of whom are unknown, of many excellent manifestos from Spain, John Most among the Germans, Spies, 
Parsons and his followers in the United States, etc. Also Domlany Yu when Hughes occupies an intermediate position in Holland. The main anarchist newspapers published after 1880 also belong to this tendency, and a large number of anarchists who also belong to it have joined the so-called syndicalist movement, the French name for the non-political labor movement, dedicated to the direct struggle against capitalism, which has recently acquired such prominence in Europe. As an anarcho-communist, the writer of this worked for many years to develop the following ideas, show the logical and intimate connection that exists between modern philosophy of the natural sciences and anarchism, give anarchism a scientific basis for the study of the trends that are evident today in society and that can indicate its subsequent evolution, and establish the foundations of anarchist morality. As for the essence of anarchism itself, it was Kropotkin's objective to show that communism, at least partial, has a better chance of success than collectivism, especially if the communes take the lead, and that the free form, or anarcho communist, it is the only form of communism that offers stable possibilities to civilized societies, communism and anarchy are, therefore, two factors of evolution that complement each other, and that make each other possible and acceptable. He has also tried to indicate how, during a revolutionary period, a large city, if its inhabitants accept the idea, could be organized according to the guidelines of free communism, the city would guarantee every inhabitant housing, food and clothing in proportion to the well-being that today only the middle classes enjoy, in exchange for a half-day or five-hour job, and that everything that was considered luxury could be obtained in a general way if individuals united during the other half of the day in all kinds of free associations that pursued the various possible objectives, educational, literary, scientific, artistic, sporting, and so on. In order to prove the first of these assertions, he has analyzed the possibilities of agriculture and industrial work, both combined with the tasks of the intellect and in order to determine the main factors of evolution of human beings, I analyzed the role played in history by constructive popular societies of mutual aid and the historical role of the state. Without anarchist headlines, Leon Tolstoy, like his predecessors of the popular religious movements of the 15th and 16th centuries, Chojeki, Denk, and many others, takes an anarchist position on the state and property rights drawing his conclusions from the general spirit of the teachings of Christ and the necessary dictates of reason. With all the power of his talent, he has carried out, especially in the kingdom of God, in ourselves, a vigorous critique of the church, the state and the law, and especially of the current property laws. He describes the state as domination of the weak, supported by brute force. Thieves, he says, are far less dangerous than a well-organized government. He makes a penetrating criticism of the prejudices in vogue today regarding the benefits that church, state and the current distribution of property confer on men and deduces from the doctrines of Christ the power of non-resistance and the absolute condemnation of all wars. But his religious arguments are so admirably combined with arguments stemming from dispassionate observation of the evils of today that the anarchist parts of his work speak to the religious reader as well as to the non-religious. It would be impossible to explain here, in such a brief sketch, the penetration, on the one hand, of anarchist ideas in modern literature, and the influence, on the other, that the libertarian ideas of the best contemporary writers have had on the development of anarchism. You can consult the ten large volumes of the literary supplement of the newspaper La Revolte and also that of Temps Nouveau in which there are quotes from the works of hundreds of modern authors who expound anarchist ideas, to understand to what extent anarchism is closely related to everything the intellectual movement of our time. Liberty by J. S. Mill, Individual vs. the State by Spencer, Morality without Obligation or Sanction by Jean-Marie Guyon La Morale, L'Art, et la Religion de Fouilly, The Works of Multatuli, E. Tzdecker. Art and Revolution by Ricardo Wagner, The Works of Nietzsche, Emerson, W. Lloyd Garrison, Thoreau, Alexander Herzen, Edward Carpenter, etc., and in the field of literature proper, the dramas of Ibsen, the poetry of Walt Whitman, War and Peace of Tolstoy, Paris and the work of Zola, 
the last books of Mirezkovsky, and countless works of lesser-known authors, are full of ideas that show how closely related anarchism is with the tasks of modern thought that follows the same tendency to free man from the shackles of the state and capitalism.